are young, but that's why you do this so that you can have young people who can operate while your technology. Awesome. Um, I wanted to talk about this this construct of Jivisawabandaming, Jivisawabandaming, which if you translate it into kind of everyday English means something like positive window shopping for your future. I'm interested in what our future is going to be like 100 years from now or 200 years from now, and who's going to be in charge of that. I'm interested in having a future where my kids can, can fish, my kids can eat wild rice. I know where our food comes from, our land comes from, that we're conscious human beings that are alive and that are connected to this beautiful land that we all came to live in. And I think that that is worth figuring out how to do that. I'm interested in that process. I don't want to spend the rest of my life reacting to stupid projects. <laughs> I spent a lot of time fighting really stupid projects. And I think that part of the discussion needs to be where it is we are going, having the agency, the commitment, and the belief that we have a right to live in a really good future here. And we have a right to that life. So I want to say that um, in our teachings as Anishinaabe people, this is a very significant time. This time, we're told, this is called the time of the seventh fire in our prophecies. And in this time, it said, you know, prophets came for our people a long time ago, and, you know, maybe we've been in this area 9,500 years. About that, a long, long time. We've been around this whole area here. You know, our people live here, right around here a long time. Those prophets came for our people a long, long, long time ago, and they told us what was going to happen. I guess that's what prophets do. They tell you what's going to happen in the future, and they talked about things in terms of times talked about them in terms of times, and they said, you know, first they said that, you know, we do pretty good, and then they talked about how we wouldn't do so well, and I always say that because no society has a monopoly on botching things up. That's what we do, we're humans. You know, we botch things up. The question is if you have the humility, the commitment, the prayer, the hard work to fix things. But humans botch things up, you know, so you just got to put your banal or your power into fixing things. They talked about some people who would come, and some of those people would be good people, and some would not be good people, and that's true. Some people that came were great, you know, awesome people, and some were just really rotten. Let's just be honest about it. And uh, they said that, you know, they said a lot of our people would disappear, and they were probably talking about smallpox. But we didn't know what that was, because we didn't have a word, you know. But 95% of our people disappeared with smallpox, just wiped out. A lot of our people never even saw a white person or a blanket. You know, it just passed so rapidly through our villages. There are places like the Mangan, the Dotsa, the Rikara, the place where the Bakken is. Right now, those people were living in herb lodges in villages. Wiped out their villages. Just wiped them out entirely. You know? Talked about how a, a lot of our things would disappear, and I'm pretty sure we didn't have a word for anthropologists, but that's what they must have been talking about. Hauling off old villages, hauling off all our stuff, putting it in museums, you know? I went out to the Smithsonian this last year. Uh, well, first, I went to that Keystone rally. You know, that, you know, some of you probably went out there, huh? That Keystone rally. I took my, my 14 year olds out there. They're 14 now, but you know, every, every teenager, every child should go to a good protest <laughs> as often as possible. You know, I was raised like that. Anyway, uh, so we go out there, and then we went to go see, I uh, went to the Smithsonian because they have our big copper rock there. It's called the Ontonagon Boulder. It's 2,500 pound boulder of pure copper that came from Keweenaw Bay area. You know, it's a, it's a sacred site and it's a sacred place. It's sacred to us as Anishinaabe. It was really funny having these conversations at the Smithsonian because I said I really like that rock back. <laughs> I mean, you know, what, why you have it here? What are you looking at? You know, you, look, you know what I'm saying? You can imagine this conversation. You know, they take me out. They explain to me how special the rock is. And I said I know it's very special. You know, but they 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 haul our sacred site away. Well, that's kind of perplexing to people. You understand what I'm saying? From our perspective, why would you haul our sacred site out there to Washington, D.C.? Then we've got to go see it, and it's like in the elevator shaft. It's too heavy for the building. They have to put it by the elevator shaft coming with a tarp. I say, you should just bring it back. Anyway, but what I'm saying is, is that that's what it's like being an indigenous person in this area. You're still trying to get back your stuff, you know? And they talked about how a lot of our people go asleep, which I think was a boarding school area the residential school era. A lot of our people were forced into these schools and really just try to reprogram them and just, just try to destroy them. And then they talk about these people who would be born. These people that would be born, they call us the Ashki Anishinaabe, the new people. In that time, they said these new people would be born and those people would remember who they were. They would remember their languages and their songs. They would go back and recover things that were taken from them. 
and they would be these people who would be conscious people. They call those the Ashki Anishinaabek, and they said that those are the people who are now. And then they said that those people would have two paths ahead of them, two Mikana. And one path, they said, was well-worn, but it was scorched. And the other path, they said, was not well-worn, and it was green. And it would be our choice upon which path to embark. And that's what those prophets told us a really, really, really long time ago. And I just say that because that's pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that's where we are now. We have two paths, one is well-scorched, well-scorched, and one is not. And I, you know, I think a lot about it because we need to be the people who, who are self-determining, that decide that we want to determine which path we go on. We need to not be in the back seat on this. We need to be in the front seat, all of us, you know, or, or determining that path. We need to be the ones that determine that path. Our Anishinaabe scholar, Anton Troyer, I really liked his book, The Assassination of Hold and Anybody, talked about having agency. I never used that word my whole life, having agency. But the idea is, is that we are conscious beings. And it turns out that we are the only ones who are here. You know, there's not somebody from someplace else that's going to save us. Not some, like, social change fairy. Not some carbon sequestration fairy. They don't exist. It's us. And we have to have the agency and the courage to do the right thing. That's what it is. It is us, you know? So that's what I'm going to talk about is some of those options, you know, and where we are. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, that because I believe that we need to think about that. And I just want to say that about a month ago, I went to Michigan. And I, you know, I travel there sometimes, and I went there, and I was at this meeting on wild rice. And there at this meeting on wild rice, they were talking about bringing wild rice back to Michigan. And you know, they used to have wild rice. They had it throughout this Great Lakes area. One of the greatest gifts the Creator gave us all is this wild rice, a food that grows on the water. But they there had lost their wild rice because of industrialization, because of herbicides in the lake, because of lakeshore development, because of extractive processes, because of imminent destruction, because that state doesn't even consider it very important, you know? And so they were talking about bringing it back. And then this woman there, she used this term that really struck me. The term was ecological amnesia. Ecological amnesia to have forgotten what your ecosystem was like, to have forgotten that you had this greatness there, and to be now living in this place where you forgot all that. And I realized I don't want to have ecological amnesia. I don't want to forget that I can drink water when I'm canoeing in the boundary waters. I don't want to forget that. I don't want to lose my rights. You know, I don't want to lose all those medicines I harvest in the woods that are so important to our family. I still want to know that I feel like I can go pray and uh, we can eat a deer and that deer's okay. You know? I want to keep working it out with the Creator and keep that covenant. I don't want to have that amnesia. So I just say that to you because I think that we are all in danger of it. We are in danger of it because society is such a jackhammer. There's so much advertisement. There's so much stuff that permeates our thinking that we get so separated. We don't want to be that. You know, that's just what I want to say. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about economics because I'm an economist. That's what I am, actually, I realized when I grew up. No, I went to school for it. I spent a lot of years. Harvard, MIT, all those years. I went to school for economics. So I want to talk a little bit about Anishinaabe economics. And what I want to say is this. Is say that you lived in a place 9,500 years and you figured out how to work it out. Say that you lived in a place that you knew how to live in a cyclical, economic cycle as opposed to a linear economic cycle. And say that in that process, there might be something that we could learn from that today. So I'm going to ask you to kind of put aside all that stuff you got, because I know you got it, because I went to the same school as y'all did. That stuff that says those people, that's really interesting what those people know, but it really is not relevant, because science and technology and Adam Smith and market economics, they got it. I'm going to tell you that that's not actually true. That it is possible to think differently. It's okay. You know, I always laugh because this month in Anishinaabe Moen is um, called the May Benegesis. It's a sucker moon. And then we have Onaba Benegesis. It's, it's a moon when it's hard custard snow. And we have a maple syrup in moon that follows up. Then we have Wab God Benegesis, our flower moon. And then we have Oday Benegesis, our strawberry moon. Mean Gesis, our blueberry moon. Manoa Medicaid Jesus, our wild rice making moon. Wajibaba Jesus, 
Benakwe o Gizis, when the leaves fall, Ashkadi o Gizis, freezes over during November. Those are our moons, and those moons are moons that are relevant here. As the moons of Ma Akil and this land. As from here. I like to share our language. I'm not like the, our, my colleague, Michael. He's, our, he's my teacher all the time. All the time he's my teacher. But I like to hear our language, and I thought you might like to hear more of it. But I also like to always say those moons because I don't know if you notice, but none of those moons is named after a Roman emperor. <laughs> Look at that. Entire worldview, nothing to do with empire. Absolutely. Can do it. Okay. This is uh, old guy from our community, Nagani Panace. He's looking out his window and he's seeing some wind turbines. That's what I like. I like the idea of how you can take sustainable values. And, and take what is appropriate technology because it is scaled right. It does not destroy your land, your culture. It is okay. All right, next slide right here. You know, in, this, in, our, in our Anishinaabe teachings, the Nisquabe, the copper belongs to the thunder beings. That's what we're told. The copper belongs to the thunder beings. It does not belong to Kemka, Anaconda, or Polymet. It belongs to the thunder beings. The Thunder Beings and Anishinaabe, all these lakes are very, very related, you know, in this region. And we know those spiritual beings. And, and Michael talked a little bit about that. But we have a worldview that is not the same as a Western worldview. We have a worldview that is from this place and lives in a land that is full of lakes and islands. That is, if you look from the air, this is so much water. And there's so many things that are below the water that are alive and have standing and have spirit and above us. And the Anishinaabe are just in this middle here. But all of us are in this middle, these beings in this above and below. I always like to show this because this is also about how uh, fire in our area, Thunderbird fire, and Thunderbird so When you have fire in our area, Anishinaabe were not afraid of setting fires when they went to set them. Then you, it brings new things after the fire. A lot of things are, are uh, fire germinated. A lot of things in the forest are fire germinated. This is our Anishinaabe uh, life cycle here. A little bit, this is about a cyclical economy. You know, in the fall, winter, spring, summer, fishing, getting your raw rice, getting your maple syrup. Those are all things that are very significant for our economy that come from this land here. The next one. This is how you kind of split it down, you know, a little bit. But what I want to say is that the significance of this economy is very, very large. Go to the next one here. This is our territory. Of course, it has that name, Enbridge Pike Park in it, but disregard, just disregard that, Pike Park in it. <laughs> Go to the next one. <coughs> our people are the northernmost corn growers in the world. I went to a really cool place last night. What was that called? Duluth Grill? <laughs> <laughs> I really liked that. That was very, very cool. Go there. You know, because they have like 30% of their food is local. But the point of this is, is that this is a, we are blessed with a very rich place, you know? We're, and even corn, like a lot of people think you cannot grow all that stuff here. We're the northernmost corn growers in the world. We push corn 100 miles north of Winnipeg. You gotta know your varieties. You gotta know what to grow. You gotta know how to talk to your corn. You gotta know how to take care of your soil. You can grow a lot of these things really up here. And this is a, just an example of our, our agricultural economy, what is here. It's very, very significant historically. I'm gonna go for, uh, take another, um, next one here. This is a really interesting statistic which has mesmerized me since I first saw it. Kiwana Bay, over on the, on the UP, right? That's a, <laughs> yes, we have a local from that. That's a lot of maple sugar, isn't it? In one year. Now, I don't know what the street value of that is. What do we, they say 14, 14 bucks a pound? Seven million dollars. Seven million dollars, there you go. One year. You know, the thing about maple or trees is that every year you can harvest. You leave your trees standing and every year you can harvest. You cut them down and you get that one time, yeah? It's a totally different way to relate. And I'm just saying that because that is, example, that is, is an example. The wealth of this area is so immense from our agricultural and our agro-biodiversity to our maple syrup. The Menominees raised a small crop this year but made about 75,000 pounds of maple sugar. Nothing to sniff out, you know, 1866. A ready sale was found. The Oneidas produced 33,000 bushels of corn. 
13,000 bushels of potatoes and had 1,500 head of horses and stock. Just really, you know, an immense, immensely wealthy place, not even to talk about fish, you know, not even to talk about fish. And I guess what I'm saying is, it's like, what a great place to be able to live, you know? What it is a great land and great waters that we're able to live here. The next one. This is what happens when things start getting messed up. You know, as uh, we're working on this, a lot of people, uh, I know that my colleague Alyssa was calling this, you know, capitalism 2.0, this encroachment here. This is capitalism 1.0, you know? So say you have an, a, an economy that a lot of people in the world have lived on for a long time, which is a self-reliant economy. That is, uh, they call it ecological economics, or they refer to it as a local economy, in our case, a Anishinaabe economy. And then you introduce an export economy to it. And that's what the United States was based on, was shipping stuff from here to someplace else, obviously. All the fur trade, all those guys, these mining companies, you start coming in here, and this is what happens to your fish stock, right? Your sturgeon. Now, why that happened to the sturgeon? You know, that's one of our plans, now made. One of our most, you know, I think of them as like the buffalo of the Ojibwe, it's so huge in their numbers, so significant spiritually to us, you know, as old as dinosaurs. That's how old they're like 230 million years old, these guys. These are some old, old fish, right? And how can you wipe them out? You know what I'm saying? Passenger pigeon, buffalo, I felt the sturgeon. You know, there's very few of them left in our area. And that collapse, you know. It had to do with logging, it had to do with overfishing. You know what they used sturgeon for? Some of you know this, isinglass. It was a distilling agent for alcohol. It was in the swim bladder of the sturgeon. And they used to extract that out of them and literally, it just breaks my heart, but they used those fish as cordwood on those boats. They burned the fish's bodies, the, the bodies of the fish, to move those boats up and down the rivers. That's how egregious the crime was against this fish. You know, and I just have to say that because that's what happened. That's what happened. You know, and that's why for us, you know, I don't want to get into the historic trauma and grief that Mishnah they suffer from, that our ecosystem suffers from. But that's what happened. And that's why it's so important. You saw a picture there in that video of us putting, Michael and I are putting them fish back into the river. Those are, those are fish that Thomas gave us to put into the river. The idea of bringing back this fish is because of how much they are a part of here spiritually, how much they're part of the ecosystem, how much they belong here. And us as Anishinaabe people, that's our clan relative. That's our relative. And we did not put those fish into the St. Louis River so that they could be poisoned by polyp. We did not do that. You know, but that is, that is a little bit of the history here. On the next one. This is the new set of mines, but in that earlier era, you had the first round of extraction that came. You know, so the Queen of England came out, and then they found that Pontonog and Boulder, and they haul it over to the Smithsonian, 1820s, 1830s. Okay, by mid-century, more than 100 copper companies had been incorporated in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan territories. Those are the major copper companies of the world. But today, come back. Kennecott, Anaconda, 3M, all those companies, they did not start someplace else. They started here. That was the foundation of those copper companies. As early as 1849, Copper production of the Kiwana Peninsula in the Anishinaabe territory led the world. Similarly, beginning in 1899, the Northern Minnesota Saw Bridge accounted for 75% of all U.S. iron ore. Most of these mining companies began here, and then they moved elsewhere around the world. In many places they were kicked out, like Chile, kicked out of there, and then they had to come home here. You know, but these corporations began here. And so I say that because sometimes we have historical amnesia. You know, I have two 14-year-olds and they're studying, they were studying European history last week, which I found quite entertaining. <laughs> and in their European history, there was this magical moment when the Renaissance occurred and there was all this money in Europe. I said, did you look at the date when the Renaissance occurred? Where did they get that money from? You understand what I'm saying. They got that money from pillaging Africa, South America, and here. That's what, you know, not to, not to you know, I know you guys all know that, right? <laughs> but, but the point was is that American education makes it up that America just got really rich and things would be going well. And you know, it all this emerged. And what I'm saying is, is that that is, you know, this is what an export economy looks like historically, from, from the land's point of view. Things are extracted, things move someplace else, things are left in disarray. Things are left in disarray. 
There's a great quote from a Latin American scholar, his name is Eduardo Galeano. He says that the colonial, the neo colonial alchemy, gold changes to scrap metal and food to poison. We have become painfully aware of the mortality of wealth which nature bestows and imperialism appropriates. You know, that is it. It's one thing after another. It's one thing after another. It is a predator economy. And a predator economy cannot be sustained. An economy based on empire and being a constant extractive predator is not sustainable. There is only this Allah king that is here. So this is the new realm you know, that we're looking at now. The poly in my mind is, is kind of the flagship of the data proposals in Minnesota. <laughs> and what, that is why it was so important for us to support Paula and the work of, of Water Legacy and all the other organizations that are working on the poly in my mind because this is such an importantly, an important bad project, you know, and the timing is so tight, you know. So, you know, again, we are urging you to bring your voices to be heard on this. Be heard on this. Bring your voices into all policy arenas, to all, you know, to all. But also, you know, part of what I'm trying to say here is, is that I think that we need to reframe the discussion a little bit. Because so long as they are able to, able to keep delivering Kool-Aid, you know, that says this is jobs, this is an economy, and there is no rethinking or decolonization of economic thinking we will be in a very difficult position. So it is not just one mine. It is a whole set of mines that are coming in in the region. And most of you know probably the most about the GTAC mine in northern Wisconsin and the struggle of the Bad River Anishinaabe against yet another mine. But it is all the same thing. It is an export economy. All of this is based on, on, on international agreements and shipping these resources and assets elsewhere. Again, shipping that which comes from us to someplace else. But it is really important, again, to look at the cumulative impact. Can I have the next slide? This is the polymer line itself. And we already saw some of these, I'm just going to go to the next one. And then this is the pipelines that are coming in. And one of the reasons that I came here, we came here, is that this is our territory. This is where our people are from. You know, the Creator put us here. The Creator did not put us someplace else in the world, but this, this place, Allah King, right here, is where the Creator put the Anishinaabe people. You know, for us, we are placed on reservations according to the convenience of the federal government. But at the same time, we know this is our land, Allah King. And Anishinaabe a King, it doesn't mean the land that you hold as private property, it means the land to which the people belong. And we understand that. And so, you know, we are fighting these pipelines, and they are coming from the West. So those pipelines will all end up here. And so that's why we are here, because we are saying we are, we are you know, 200 miles west of you. But we are, what we are doing is trying to protect you when those pipelines come in here anymore. Seven pipelines is enough. <laughs> you don't need any more. You don't need any more industrial corridors at all. You know, at this point, the most tar sands and the most oil that is moving in the continent of the United States is moving across Minnesota to Superior. Well, that's not a good thing to think about that, to think about the level of impact that we have and the level that is, that is, project, that is projected to, to go. So what we are saying is, is that, you know, these agencies, they cannot have the si silo of a view. You know, what is convenient in the EIS process, I went to see the EPA in Region 5 a few weeks ago. I had never been to see the EPA. I was informed, sadly, that they told me, we're not the Environmental Protection Agency, we're the Environmental Pollution Permitting Agency. <laughs> That's what they told me. I said, oh, I'm so disappointed. I thought you were my guys. I thought you were Environmental Protection Agency. No, we're really the Environmental Pollution Permitting Agency. So, you know, I guess what my point is, is that in, in the convenience of their discussion, they like to have an EIS that is one line. They do not want to talk about the cumulative impact. And the economics of these projects always talks about one, and it does not talk about the cumulative or the full cost accounting of these projects. And that is part of what really must be discussed. Because it is not only the immediate impact, it is also, as Paula said, the long term project impact, and the larger impact on the region for all of us. Because all of these together 
really will devastate our, they will really devastate our region if they are all allowed to go through. And that is why it's really important that we have agency and that we act, you know, in all of the arenas that are open to us and open more to us in order to, to, to defend our, our land and our water. The next slide. This is the Sandpiper Line, and you saw this in the last. And uh, you know, there's, uh, where's my friends from Carleton County? I've seen some of them here. Look at all those people from Carleton County. Man. <laughs> Been hanging out for about a month, month and a half. We're we're, we're tight. <laughs> you know, I did not want to grow up and work on pipelines. I never really worked fighting pipelines. You know, just honestly. But then they decided to shut this pipeline down. I wrote home my resignation. I said, "That's enough. That's not going to happen." My closest one right there. You know, but then we found these other guys that had already been resisting it, and so we joined up with them. And some of you have seen the billboard. When I'm bored, I buy, buy billboards. I that billboard going up north on I-35 right by Broadway. Got another one going into Leech Lake, looking at one. But uh, you know, it is really interesting because um, it's important that people get outside of their arena of comfort sometimes. It is really time. You know, I have a very privileged life, and I remember, um, you know, one of my great mentors is Ralph Nader. I always liked what he said. You know, sometimes a private citizen must become a public citizen. You know, because if we all stay within our arenas of comfort, then they will continue to do what they think they can do. You have to step outside of it, and you have to, you have to put power and stand and oppose these things. And remember that there are people all over the world that are opposing these projects. You saw that video, you know? I mean, in the time that we have been working on these issues, people have opposed fracking successfully in a number of places. You know, it is gonna, it, you know, we have to be diligent and push. You know, on this. So I'm just saying I want to thank the Carlton County landowners for their, not only for fighting pipelines, but for the fact that they're cool. You know? <laughs> they're farmers. You know? That's like the coolest thing. I would rather just be a farmer, but I've got to do some of this other stuff. <laughs> you know, but that's very cool. All right, the next one. This is why we're fighting it too. I don't know if you've seen this, but this is the Bakken. You know? The second, the second line is a sandpiper. And, you know, both the Alberta Clipper timetable at the PUC Public Utilities Commission and the, and the Sandpiper are beginning to tick. You know, these pipeline companies, it is the same thing. It is, it is for multinationals. Enbridge is a Canadian corporation, right? They believe that they are entitled to take oil from someplace else, and, and Minnesota is just the place that they pass over. We do not get a benefit, and we assume all the risk for it. Yeah? And uh, you know, we were talking to some of these landowners over by us, and, and uh, Michael and I, and Thomas, and we even brought the Irish girl over. And uh, we went down, and you know, they're kind of conservative guys, you know, some of them. And I was talking to the Kiwanis Club on Tuesday, you know, those are kind of conservative bunch. And I said, you guys, pipelines, pipelines do not improve your property value. <laughs> you know, they diminish your property value. Yeah. Let's, we can start with that, you know? And so you assume the risk while the corporation gets all the profit. Right? And it is the same thing because whether it is a historic export industry of the copper from the Great Lakes to these present industries, all the risk and all the long-term impact is assumed by us. This is the bucket, and this is just some uh, spills that are occurring in the bucket. You know, I just have to say that I did not sign up to create national sacrifice areas. Yeah. And that is what they're doing in the bucket. That's what they're doing in the tar sands. And that is wrong to create national sacrifice areas because of greed and because of addiction and because of inefficiencies. Really, really important. We, you know, largest energy consumers per capita, we consume more energy than anybody else in the world per capita, except for the Canadians. I don't know how they can beat an American, but I think it's because they're colder, huh? That's all. You know what I'm saying? But the fact is, is that that energy consumption is largely predicated on inefficiency. Between point of origin and point of consumption, about 70% of the energy is wasted. So I did not sign up to waste, create wastelands for inefficient energy production. And I'm pretty sure none of us did. Inefficiency makes no sense in our economy. It makes no sense to aggrandize it and to continue propping it up. I'll go to the next slide.
This is a little bit more about the copper. Does it even come close? And just as an example, the problem is, and as Paula talked about it, is that mining is a really, really bad thing for energy. Take the next picture. It turns out that the largest consumers of Minnesota power are, in fact, these mines. And then some pulp and paper mills. And then the pipelines, right? So, you know, I was saying, I was wondering about those, those uh, coal plants. And, you know, one is 82 years old. That's a really old coal plant. My mother is 81. You know, she's not operating as a coal generator. But that's, you know, those are some old damn plants. Right? You know, you understand what I'm saying is that they're old, they're inefficient, and uh, we should not be, that should not be our plan. I mean, one of their plans is old because they don't build any coal plants in this country anymore because coal is, uh, coal is passe. And so, single largest CO2 emissions are coal. You know, of course, they try to replace it all with fracked oil. But in the meantime, you've got some dinosaurs out there that are powerless. Now, one of the reasons I came to here and to discuss this all with you, you know, this afternoon, my friend Alyssa put together this fact sheet. Yesterday, my friend Michelle put together this PowerPoint <laughs> as we were driving up. Having said that, we did research this time. And what I want to say is, is that one of the reasons I came here and I wanted to have this conversation in Duluth is because I've been working for these people called the Northern Cheyenne for most of my adult life off and on. They uh, came from here. They are our relatives, the Cheyenne people. They also speak our language. So long ago did they come from here that their language has changed entirely. But the Cheyenne came from here as well. They're Algonquin speakers. And Spirit Mountain is one of their sacred sites. One of their most sacred places. And so the Cheyenne, for many years, they're very courageous people. They have a small reservation in, in Montana. And they fought very, very hard. Many of their people were killed. And they fought for their homeland. They fought for their homeland. And then, for the past 50 years, they've been fighting mining companies off of their homeland. Coal. Because they are in the heart of the Potter River Basin. And they do not want any coal on their land. They do not want the coal companies on their land. And so a, a small tribe has fought these companies off for 30 years. No, for more than that, for 50 years. 74 is when they passed their Clean Air Amendments so that their tribe declared Class 1 Clean Air. That was a very long time they've been fighting these companies. And these guys are, you know, the thing with our, our First First Nations, our indigenous people, is that, you know, if you're going to look at, they call it underdeveloped countries. We are underdeveloping as economies. Our tribal nations are. Our resources have been stripped from us for hundreds of years, including our intellectual wealth. A lot of our people ship off, go to school, never come home. You understand what I'm saying? If you look at a third world country, you place it in North America, that's kind of Indian reservations. And now, today, every problem you, you don't want to have, we got. So these guys now have this new influx of meth that came into their community. They have a new influx of prescription pills. And they have a new influx of many other things that have come into their community that came just as the time. This new corporation, Arch Coal, came in with a new proposal for coal strip mining. And who requested that coal? Who requested that the spur from the coal to the, to the railroad line be built? Who wrote the intervening letter? Minnesota Power. It's Minnesota Power that is driving that market for coal from the Northern China Reservation. So that's one of the reasons that I'm here, is to say these companies cannot say that their impact is right here. Their impact will have huge human rights, economic, environmental impact on a community that is 1,000 miles away, or 800, I don't know, very far. I don't know, 14 hours by car from <laughs> my reservation. I don't know, long ways. You understand what I'm saying? So you cannot pretend that we live in a bubble, and they cannot pretend that they live in a bubble. Coal is inefficient, and the fact is, is that it is, it is uh, and that coal for mining is even more inefficient, as Paula said. The fact is, is that, I think we can go for the next slide. There, this is, this is their, their community. It's called the Otter Creek Mine that they're opposing. 
And that's my friends. That's Alexis. She works for the Sierra Club. And that's Vanessa Braided Hair. And she's Northern Cheyenne. You know? And um, I just want you to remember their faces and the name of this community. Because it means something here. And they're far away. But what happens here with these battles against these mines <coughs> affects them? Because those mines need to be powered. And that power is supposed to come from them. The fact is that the recovery ratio for copper is 0.15, much smaller than other metals. In other, in other words, you need to remove a billion tons of material to recover 1.6 tons of copper. The only metal that is crazy to try to, try to get out is gold. You know? I feel like it's time to get over, you know, being gnomes or whatever it is. Time to quit digging. You know? Just go dig up the land first. It's, it's all there. All your coppers right there, you know. All right. Next one. This is how much your floods cost you for climate change. Uh, um, you know, cost you more than that. Huh? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I mean that's just the figures we pull. But you know, I you know, in my privileged life, I wander around and hear crazy stories. So as I was visiting with my friends in Native Hawaiians, I find my telescope project in uh it's the, it'd be the 14th telescope on Mauna Kea, their sacred site. They figured 13 was enough, you know? It'd be the biggest telescope out there, 30 feet wide, and, you know, eight stories down, and I don't know, it's just one massive telescope for, I don't know, for seeing outer space, apparently. But, um, you know, the Hilo advertiser and, and the company is pitching back $1.5 billion project as a jobs creator. You know, do a mega project and get some jobs. And that is kind of the mantra that occurs in America. Build something big and make jobs. Build something really, really big and make jobs. Now it turns out that those projects don't make a lot of big jobs. They make some short-term construction jobs. But at the end of it, the people that are going to be working in Monarchy are a bunch of, you know, scientists and astronomers from other countries, right? Not local people. And that's the same thing with these pipelines, particularly. You're going to have 1,500 jobs over three months. And then they're gone. Then you're going to have some pipelines that are going to be washed by some guys up in Saskatchewan and Edmonton, and you better pray that it's go well. Right? The fact is, is that the amount of jobs that you can get from investing in a tank that is infrastructure is much higher. I think we have that next slide. If you just did wastewater, it's, you know, I'm not against pipelines, just dirty oil pipelines, right? I like pipelines that function, and, and apparently Duluth probably got about a D plus in infrastructure, right? The whole country has like a D plus in infrastructure, right? Across the board. All of our infrastructure is aging, and so what happens now is these corporations get to dictate which infrastructure is built. <coughs> and call it job creation. The fact is, is that what you need is investment, yes, in pipelines, but not their pipelines. Okay. And so this is the kind of things that we need to demand, is do not make some false, you know, false challenge between jobs and the environment. Say, yeah, we want jobs, but we want jobs because they're in the industry. It's just like those railways. You know, those railways in this country are probably about a D minus, right? Yeah. And now they've got fracked oil trains, 300,000 of them out there, right? On those aging railways. Now they're trying to say, well, it shouldn't move oil on railways because it's dangerous. I'm saying fix the railways, right? I'm not supporting fracking, I'm just saying fix it on railways. Oh my God, I'd like to have a train that would run in Detroit Lakes more than 3 a.m. <laughs> what Amtrak train in, a day, 3 a.m.? Wouldn't it be great to have trains that worked? And carry people, not oil, and coal? All right, next one. Yet another geeky slide. Job creation, much better than pipelines, mines, boom towns. 
the construction job creation is set up, canceled. Paul R. showed me this. Unless you get a bunch of too much Fox News, this is reality. <laughs> you want, don't want to add more lines to it. Don't want to add more pipelines to it. Don't want to add more product wells to it. Don't want to add more tar to it. Don't want to add more coal to it. Okay, next one. And you don't want to destroy your ecosystem and export to China. Which is basically what we're looking at right now. And so to me, that is part of the deconstructing of their economics. Just because you can sell your ecosystem to someone doesn't mean you should. You know, we've entered this era that is so extreme. It is extreme energy and it is extreme extraction. And it is not, it is not at all about the benefit of globals. All right, let's go to the next one. I'm hoping I'm getting to the happy ones. Yeah. Very close here. All right, this is a uh, really, I love this quote. This is our ride in the Dakotas. How long are you going to let other people decide the future for our children? Are you not warriors? It's time to stop talking and to start doing. Long time ago, when our ancestors rode into battle, they didn't know what the outcome was going to be, but they did it because they knew it was in the best interest of the children. When people don't operate from a place of fear, operate from a place of hope. Anything is possible, but you need to take action. The movement is here, and the time is now. I just really want to say that because there are a lot of people that operate from a place of fear. It's really important not to operate from a place of fear. All right, here we are in the happy part. Thank God. <laughs> Your local economy. This is not the best picture, but this is what we have. This is a uh, high point elementary school about two years ago. Me attempting to teach uh, corn husk doll action figure and doll baby <laughs> and braiding to a bunch of children. But farm school, local schools. Rebooting the local food economy is essential. That's what our corn looks like. That's a Manitoba white flint. That's a stuff that'll grow 100 miles north of Winnipeg. That's the kind of stuff you want to grow. Rocks and B vitamins, especially when you cook it as hominy in ashes. Bioactivates the B vitamins. Twice the protein, half the calories. About an 80 day, 90 day growing season. See what I'm saying? It's not just what you go, then you get all those cool high tunnels and everything. All cool stuff. But also grow some stuff that uh, those old school guys are really cool. Next one. This is your local food economy. This is my reservation. You guys might have a different take on this, I'm not sure. But basically, the reason I show this slide is we did a study on my reservation in 2008. We sample our households and we figure out that the households spend about total $8 million a year on food of which $7 million we spent off reservation almost immediately. Importing food from, uh, you know, we go to Walmart and shop, and then we get a lot of stuff from Food Service of America, all those other guys, right? You know, I was up at Grand Portage about three weeks ago, and those guys are like at the end of the Food Service of America truck, right? They're like, we want the good food, don't just give us like the leftovers, right? But I was just thinking that is such a remote village, they really need a local food economy. Because the fact is that all this stuff that we're getting right now is all predicated on access to cheap oil. Price of oil goes up, price of fossil fuels goes up, price of food goes up. So this is about you know a local food economy. But the point of this also is, is that they're always saying you need more jobs and more money coming to your economy. But the fact is, is that between food and energy, on my reservation, we spend 25% of our money on food and 25% of our money on energy. And both of those economies are hemorrhaging. They're outsourced, right? And so you pour in money into your local economy and it pours out, right? It makes no sense to keep pouring money in when you got a hemorrhage. So the point is, is that figuring out how to live for a, a while or a thousand years from now, like Mike Wiggins says, is predicated on re restoring a self-reliant local economy, particularly for those of us that live here. Because everything else is far away. So it is back to those things that are so awesome the Creator gave us. All those local pools, all those gardens, all that fish, 
all that maple syrup and all that wild rice. Next picture. My favorite guy. How many of you guys know him? Will Allen? Duluth should have like the Will Allen people. <laughs> right? And I'm sure you guys are on it. Was that you, Francois? I'm not planning for that. We you know, have one. that's right. There you go. <laughs> Francois. Cool guy. I just met Francois yesterday. He's a very cool guy. But the point is, is that this is Milwaukee. And on three acres, they produce a million pounds of food. They're like doing the vermiculture thing with the worms. They got the aquaponics, is it? Yeah. Aquaponics. Thank you. They got greenhouses, you know, almost all year round. You know, that's like a cool dude, man. And we should be, Duluth should be that. Yes. You know? And they're getting that food into the schools and then they're getting all the scraps back from the schools. It's a cycle. That's the difference between an export economy and an industrial economy and a sustainable or an indigenous economy, one that's based on the earth. A cyclical economy means that you don't drain everything out. And that is the only hope we have to be self-reliant. You cannot export your ecosystem and all your money to China. You have to keep things local. So he's got it. And there's really no reason we cannot do that here in Duluth. Next one. That's our cool corn project. I'm not going to go totally into it, but what I'm going to say is that my father passed away about 20 years ago. But one day he came to see me when I was at school, when I was out east at school, and he says, Winona, you're a really smart young woman, but I don't want to hear your philosophy if you can't grow corn. <laughs> so I grow corn. But you know, this is our Bear Island Flint, Jonesy Miller's from Nobert Menominee. It's a really cool corn. Never had a crop failure. You know, it grows about this tall. It's uh, frost resistant. It's drought resistant. The big winds came through and blew over on Santos fields, but left our fields. You know what we use on it? Fish cats. That's what we use. I'm working on this project with Red Lake Reservation now with their Red Lake fisheries because they have 400,000 pounds of fish waste from their commercial fishery of walleye fillets. That's what they're selling as walleye fillets. And so what we're working on is a project to turn that all into fish in motion because that belongs in the soil, all that. You know, so that's what I'm saying. Get the petroleum out of our systems. We'll be a lot better off. Those are some other varieties to grow. Pink Lady, people say, why do you grow that Pink Lady? It tastes great. Flower corn, I said, I grow it because it's pink. I like pink corn. <laughs> Someone say, grow blue corn. I said, grow blue corn yourself. <laughs> There's all kinds of varieties, 8,000 varieties. You grow whatever kind you want. And that's cool corn. This is uh, Ivan Curry. This is what you want. That's an old school squash. That's a little bit of our future there. Next one. This is our uh, uh, Medewin lodges. And then they were talking about those fancy high tunnels. So I said, okay, I'll make one in this next one. There you go. That's very clear. We do them a little lower, but the point was you can take your own stuff, you know? You adapt your wig bump structure, make one of those. So my point is, is that if you relocalize your food economy and relocalize your energy economy, you're gonna be a lot better off. Next one, that's our rice economy on why fiber. It's worth fighting for. That's like I said, you know, I need to go out there. I'm not a protester, I'm not for protecting this though. You know, why would you, why would you want to mess with something that's so great that Creator gave us? And Paula knows, and all of you know, that wild rice doesn't grow in sulfide. Doesn't go on sulfide contaminated waters. So protect the rice, stand for it. Don't stand for paddy rice. Stand for the 100,000 acres of lake rice here. Because it tastes like a lake, it doesn't taste like a paddy. It wasn't grown with fossil fuels, it was grown by the Creator. Stand for the lake rice. You know, it's our state grade, but it's a sacred food that belongs in this ecosystem. That's our reservation, very big out of that. Okay, go on the next one. And this is my hilarious quote of last year. How many of you saw this? $18 million theft here. Okay, 
So it turns out, you know, did you guys get the idea that we used to produce a lot of maple sugar here? <laughs> and it got all messed up. Colonialism messed up things. In this case, it was colonialism. It was also the Catholic Church didn't like that. They said that the shepherd, you know, the sheep were too far from the shepherd. That was a Jesuit quote. Because the Indians were having such a good time out there in the sugar bush, they didn't come to church. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm all for having a good time in the woods. I want to go back in the woods. Bracing, sugaring, those things keep you on the land. Anyway, we did all that. And now, this was last year, this horrible thing occurred in, in uh, Quebec. $18 million, single largest theft of a commodity product in Canada. And what it was is that it turns out that Canada is hoarding maple syrup. What? Yes. Right, exactly. They got like 40, 40 million pounds of it sitting in because they want to keep the price up. And Quebec is the largest producer. They got about 70% of the syrup up there because we're not out there making syrup. You understand what I'm saying? So they're out there, they got this corner on the market. And so they hoard it to keep the price up. Not, I'm, not, I'm not dissing Quebecers. Just the maple syrup cartel. That's what they call themselves, the maple syrup cartel. So then these guys, they said it was an inside job. They uh, rent the storehouse next to where they got like millions of gallons of the syrup store. They rent the storehouse next to it, some inside guys. They go and they switch the barrels, 55 gallon barrels, put these ones with water in there. They walk away with $18 million worth of syrup. It's a huge international conspiracy, controversy, and scandal. Horrible. Anyway. They did find those guys. It's very hilarious. It feels, I think it's either on, I think it's on the Colbert Report. Anybody see that one? On the, I think it was the Colbert Report or John Stewart. They did a little, little thing on it. This reporter went up there. He was like, all oh, the syrup. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but the point of this is, we should challenge that cartel. Yeah. That's my point. Minnesota, get proud. Let's get out there and make some syrup. After we we was at we was at uh, Fond du Lac yesterday, and I went and. Uh, me and Michelle went and followed uh, Bruce Savage around. He's a heck of a servant. Huh? I can't hear for nothing. <laughs> attend these and be very present. And as Paula said, we need to be writing these letters 
But also, ultimately, what I'm saying here is, is that I think it is essential that we challenge their paradigm. They cannot continue with this paradigm because their paradigm in their accounting is bad. You know, you cannot say that you are the Enbridge Corporation and you've been here for 60 years and you'll be here after that. You know, 60 years is not as long as the 9,000 years that we have lived here. I cannot trust a 60-year-old corporation with my water. I cannot trust a new junior <coughs> Canadian mining company owned by somebody else with anything. Right? Their math is for now. But the larger picture that we tell you that everybody knows is that, is that when you consider the impact of your decisions today, you have to consider the impact upon the seventh generation from now. In ecological terms, there are some basic terms in ecological economics. Interspecies equity. Intergenerational equity. We have no right to deprive those future generations of this water, of these lakes, of these trees, and of these ecosystems. You cannot discount into the future, as these mining companies do and as these pipeline companies do, because in fact, their impact will increase in the future with bioaccumulation. And the price tag will be higher and higher, and they will not be here to pay it. And that is why it is so essential to challenge their economic paradigm. You know, I lecture at colleges all the time, and I'm baffled why these universities still teach Keynesian economics, still teach mar you know, market economics as if it is a truth, and in fact, it is a fable. And then we need to look at the policy changes that are essential. You know, make the Minnesota PCA stand by the protection of wild rice. Essential. And then look at these larger pictures. You know, the fact is, is that these larger pictures, they did not delist the wolf just to delist the wolf. They delisted the wolf because they knocked an endangered species off in the area they wanted to mine. That's why they delisted the wolf. You do not delist the wolf and then go in and start opening a hunting season up. You watch them and you monitor them if you're actually trying to monitor them as you should as an agency. You know, all of these things are so politicized. And then you look at the larger issues, as I said. We need local, we need ordinances for local energy, ordinances for local food. We need ordinances like those proposed and underway in many counties by the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund to protect our water, to allow counties, allow townships to not be sprayed, to allow us to not have mines. And then again, we need to always consider and look to the larger issues of how it is we're going to be here a thousand years from now. Those are public policy questions, but those are questions really at some level of us. You know, we're the ones that are here now in this room and in this city. If you look, this is a really nice city. You know, I, I haven't even been here that many times, I realize. I get lost every time I come here. <coughs> you know, and I cannot use a GPS very well. My GPS, anyone ask you, my GPS is usually I holler out the window <laughs> to ask someone which way it is to get someplace. This old school GPS <laughs> system, you know? But I guess I say that because, you know, Duluth's a great place. <laughs> you know? This could be the city that shows people how to do stuff. Like, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. I think that's it. I think we just got that last one. That's our honor the earth, yeah? That's us. That's how you find us on the web. Miigwech, Mew. Thank you for your time.